my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you are having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. Today, we're going to be talking about Nathan Brooks. Nathan was only 14 years old when he harmed his parents. This story is a complete puzzle. I know some of you guys may disagree with my stance on this case. I am really curious to hear your thoughts at the end. I have to admit, I just got over the worst flu I have ever had. It ran through my whole family. There was a point in time that I felt like I hurt so bad, all I could do was sleep. So I slept and slept and slept for a good 24 hours, and now I'm on day three with absolutely no energy. And content must be delivered to you guys. So thanks you guys for being here with me, and please forgive my mood. This case is not the best case to cover when you're in a mood, but let's just get right into it. On March 8th, 2013, Nathan Brooks, the high achieving and seemingly happy 14 year old is from Moses Lake, Washington. He was also a star athlete on the basketball team and was said by his peers to be a leader and was popular at school. When Nathan wasn't in school, he and his family were active hunters. So it is a puzzle why this 14 year old walked into his parents' bedroom while they were sleeping and shot them both in the head, emptying his gun completely out of bullets. No one, not even Nathan, seems exactly sure why he did it. He said he considered not shooting them right before he did it, but before he knew it, he started shooting. And the whole time, the parents are not even aware who has shot them. The dad is now shot in the head, but still alive. He calls 911. Here is that 911 call. 911, what's the address of the emergency? I do zero South Battery Road. Somebody broke it. We've all been shot. I don't know. I woke up and we've all been shot. Who's been shot, sir? My wife and I. Yes, I got blood all over everywhere. I've been shot in the head. When officers arrived on scene, they first saw Nathan. He was wearing only his white underwear. The officers described him as very calm and didn't seem to be upset with everything that was happening. He let the first responders in the door and led them upstairs. When officers reached the master bedroom, there was blood everywhere. They said both parents were bleeding profusely. Beth, the mother, kept repeating, why? Why did this happen? What happened? Even though the dad had been shot in the head, he was able to get his daughter into the room safely behind him. He said his son Nathan poked his head in the bedroom, so he got him safely behind him. He had no idea that Nathan was the one that shot him. Where's the suspect now? I don't know. We're hiding in the room. My daughter's with me. I don't know where my son is. For this family, hunting was a huge part of them. It was very much handed down from one generation to the next. The grandma talks about Nathan's first kill and how they had the skull mounted. She pointed out this and it was just normal for them. She talked about how he was when he killed his first deer and that he added that his mother had been just as excited when she shot her first kill. She says it's hunting, not killing. She really wanted that to be known. Nathan's grandma proudly displays his first deer trophy mounted on her wall. She says for them it's a way of life, what they were raised with. I don't have an opinion on hunting, but what I do know is of course where there is hunting there are guns and this family had a lot of them. The area of Washington where they lived is a peninsula and there are many trails, lakes, and parks. In the summer, there's fishing, swimming. Then in the winter, they have beautiful trails to cross in hunting tournaments. 
the Brooks even had a backyard pool. All that to say Nathan and his family were active within the community. When Nathan's friends spoke later, he said that he was well-liked by everyone at school. Everybody knew Nathan. He was great in sports and had all the girls' attention. He was known always to include others. When Nathan was 14, he was playing basketball for the Christian school that he attended. Police arrived at the home after John made the 911 call to say that he had been shot by a stranger. He reported waking up to the first shot being fired, seeing a figure standing in the doorway and rolling off the bed to grab his gun, which he kept under the mattress. When he was grabbing the weapon, he heard several more shots. Once he got the gun out, the figure was gone, and he realized his wife was shot. The investigation report noted two officers recognized Nathan Brooks because he played basketball on the teams with the police officer's sons. As the officers entered the residence, an officer asked Nathan, where the shooter was, and Nathan told him the shooter had left, according to the police report. Officers found six spent 22 shell casings and found the victims. John had been shot at least one time in the head, and his wife Beth had been shot at least twice, once in the left side of her face and once in the hand. A surveillance camera John set up to monitor whether Nathan was doing his chores or not reportedly caught the teen walking through the living room carrying the gun. And there, recorded on the monitor at the time of the attack, was a near-naked Nathan Brooks walking through the home with a gun in his hand. While Nathan has no criminal history, Moses, like police, have previously investigated a report of him allegedly assaulting a younger girl in an inappropriate way. This was in 2010. According to the police report, Mr. Brooks allegedly refused to let police, the father, refused to let them talk to the son about the events, and then the charges were never filed. I'll leave my sources below so you can check it out. Nathan and parents both deny abuse in the home. Nathan said he wanted to kill his parents since he was eight years old and said he did it because they took away his video games. Nathan reportedly confessed to trying to kill his parents in the bedroom of their Battery Road home while being interrogated at the police station. He was allegedly upset with being grounded for two weeks from using his electronic devices, so basically his video games he played all the time when he wasn't at school. There are so many differences in what Nathan originally said happened and what the story would would end at. First that year, Nathan was active in school, including after school activities like being on the basketball team. So being at home and playing video games 24 7 isn't accurate. Also, originally, Nathan told the police he saw someone else leave the home. Someone else shot his parents. When first questioned by the police, he didn't know his parents had set up a surveillance camera within the house. In his first interview, he said he was asleep and he woke up a with a few gunshots. He said he had heard screaming, but it was more like yelling. But he could hear his dad yelling. Tell me what went on down at your folks' house tonight. So I was asleep and I woke up, there was, I don't know, a few gunshots and I heard screaming, but it was more like yelling. I could hear my dad yelling. He said he ran downstairs because he had heard the shootings upstairs, so he figured the best place to go would be downstairs. He said while hiding in the library area, he saw a big guy come down the stairs. The guy reloaded the gun at the point Nathan describes the sound as tink, tink, tink of the bullets being loaded one by one. And then the guy ran back upstairs, was up there for a while, ran down the stairs out of the back door and left. 
So this is his bad guy. Remember, he doesn't know his parents have a surveillance camera inside the house. So he knew they had cameras, but he didn't know the placement of them because they moved them. Even though this interview was immediately after the shooting, the police already knew about this interior camera. They had already reviewed the footage of Nathan and his white underwear running through the house. So they tell him it was there in the kitchen and ask what it caught tonight what did they what was this footage going to tell them he confesses he says it would have seen him break open his parents plastic gun safe and get the 22 gun he ran upstairs with it then he describes how he shot them he starts to cry when he realizes he's going to jail says it's it was stupid, but he is very calm with no emotion, says he took the gun to use it for what guns are meant to do, to kill. I'm giving you a chance to be honest with me because you haven't been to this point. I don't even know what I was thinking. And what were you trying to do when you pulled the trigger? What a gun does. Which is? Kill. He said his goal when he walked in there was to kill both his parents. When asked why he did this, Nathan talks about how much he was punished. He talks about mopping the floors and he has to do the whole house as if it's a mansion or something. Then he is told to vacuum the carpet and it is the same description as if there's so much carpet he'll never be able to complete the task. He finishes that and his mom asked him to clean up the dog mess in the yard. These are all the chores that a normal teenager might be assigned. What Nathan is not saying is that he is not only in trouble for getting detention that day for being late to class, but he was recently allegedly caught stealing his mother's credit card. Nathan had been getting into trouble at home for a while and it had nothing to do with video games, which is what he tells the officer. He says that his dad grounded him that day from his cell phone and Xbox, basically all electronic devices, and he wasn't allowed to play in the basketball tournament and that just made him snap. He had only been grounded that day just a few hours. Given his behavior, these seem like normal things a parent might do. More chores, take away privileges. Nathan tries to make it seem like his parents were very strict on him and he had no fun and they were taking away his rights. I just remember thinking that it would be much better if they weren't around to, to boss me around to tell me what to do. and. I pulled the trigger three times at my mom, bang, 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 and then I aimed it towards my dad and I pulled it another three times. To be clear, he's 14. You don't have rights, you have privileges. So he gets grounded. And this wasn't the first time, but he wants the police to believe that this is why just a few short hours later, he shot his parents because he had to do chores. When he is interviewed, he gives no other insights. The police report, he shows no remorse. He does not cry, but only when he is caught lying. After that, he gives a clear account of what happened. He says he stood at the foot of the bed. He took aim at his mom first because his mom was the one that assigned all those chores and grounded them. She was the one that was dealing out the punishments he fired three times at her and then he aimed at his father and shot at him the remaining three times and I have to wonder is that calculated he knew he had six bullets so he's gonna do three on mom and three on dad how long had this kid been thinking about it I guess he said since he was eight so I guess he had been thinking about it for a while. He says he then went downstairs to reload. He says he is at the bottom of the stairs trying to reload when he hears his father yelling that he is getting his gun. He says he panicked. 
He heard sirens in the distance. He knows fa his father had already managed to call 911. He runs out into the backyard and throws the gun into the family swimming pool. He comes back inside and is there to greet the first responder and let them into the home. When the police ask where the gunman is, he tells them they had left and ran, as I mentioned earlier. So now he has given his account. He shows no remorse. He also does not ask how the parents are. When he's interrogated at the police station, he doesn't even ask how they are at all. Don't care. The police say he didn't ask even once. Officer Rick Francis, the first responder, says he believes there is more to the story that is not being told. Although Nathan has no criminal record in 2010, police were investigating a report that Nathan had done that to that younger girl at the time when he was 11. Francis says that Mr. Brooks refused to allow to be interviewed by the investigation and so it went nowhere. When a reporter asked the father why he wouldn't allow the police to talk to Nathan to complete the interrogation, the father says that he found out through the school that the alleged issue was wrong and that the police talked to the victim and found out that there was nothing to be charged for. Now to be clear, nothing to be charged with does not always mean nothing happened. It may mean the victim's family did not want to put them through a lengthy investigation. Either way, John Brooks shielded Nathan from being spoken to, which as a parent was his right. He's allowed to do that, but it leaves a big question mark. The reporter did ask for clarification if any abuse, be it physical or sexual, had taken place under the Brooks roof by either parents, and they stated none none whatsoever. He had been in trouble for being in school detention for tardiness. He allegedly stole his mother's credit card. Kind of minor compared to where he lands, but maybe it's an escalation. I'm not sure. The detective in charge of the shooting believes that Brooks moved their security camera. The father moved the security cameras inside in order to watch Nathan because they were afraid of him. Perhaps they were right to be after all that we know now and after what happened. Do you have any doubt that he knew what he was doing? Oh no, I, I, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, when you get up close and personal, when you do a crime like that um, and you shoot somebody point blank, you put a gun in their face and then you pull the trigger, um, that's personal. Investigators said that Nathan has never shown any remorse for his actions and never showed interest in his family's health while they were in the hospital after he shot them. And Nathan says that he went back downstairs to reload the gun because he realized his mother was still alive. But then he heard his father say he has his own gun. So then Nathan didn't, didn't go back there and shoot him, but his intention was to. After Nathan is arrested, he is let out on bail. At 14, he needs somewhere to go, so he talks to his grandma. It could have been grandpa too, but I just remember seeing the interview with the grandma. So he talks to her about coming to stay with her until the trial. The grandma was clearly scared and hesitant. So Nathan said to her, if you are too scared for me to come stay there, I will not come. This was enough for the grandma to feel comfortable because she said she knew how bad he wanted to get out of there and the fact that he was willing to stay there spoke volumes to her and so she let him come stay with her or hear me out if you are me an outsider looking in in my opinion i see the works of a master manipulator. Nathan was originally charged with two counts of attempted murder in the shooting of his parents. There was a question as to whether he would be charged as a youth or as an adult. He was very young when he shot his parents at only 14 years old, but if he had been tried as a youth, his sentence would have ended when he was only 21 years old with no supervision after that point. 
Because there was no clear-cut motive in the case, the prosecutor was very nervous at the thought of Nathan not having any oversight. He was charged as an adult. He could have been sentenced to up to 50 years in prison. He did take a plea deal. He pled guilty to two counts of assault in the first degree. He was sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison. He also has 10-year mandatory mental health evaluations following his release. His parents said this justice system really had no place for them. The prosecution didn't want to talk to them because they were his parents, and the defense didn't want to talk to him because they were his victims. They were able to tell the judge that they knew their son would face justice and that they still loved him. After Nathan was sentenced, he was evaluated by mental health professionals. He was overall diagnosed with depression. He has latched onto this diagnosis as to why he shot his parents. Millions of people have depression, they've diagnosed or not, who are not aggressive in any way and as to why he shot his parents. In the beginning, it was because of video games, and then it was too many chores, and then it was mean parents. Now it's depression. It's like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And I have to say that the, the mental health professional, the psychiatrist that's working with Nathan, when she talks about him, she has a fondness for him which again could be manipulation because we're all human even though she's trained in that field he's a young kid your heart goes out to him you want to see the positive in him but again like i said when she talks about him i'm like well, it's a lot of positive rave reviews about this kid that shot his parents he's clearly not healthy give me something here so anyways, when Beth, the mom, talks about her son, the son that shot her in the frigging face, it is very glowing terms, but also a bit past tense, which is odd. She says when he was born, he was wonderful. He was a super cuddly baby that she fell for him instantly. Because he entered prison so young, he did finish high school and she would receive his report cards, which she appreciates. She keeps a box of memories for him when he is released. In watching her, it seems she struggles continuously with the love she has for her child and the betrayal that she feels as well. Nathan has apologized, and even if the question of motive is unclear, the forgiveness part is not. I love you, buddy. They say they loved their son. They raised him with love. John and Beth, the parents, live four hours away from Nathan and visit him every few months. Shoot me in the face and see if I'm driving four hours to see you. You know who this guy Nathan reminds me of? And some of you guys may not watch this show, but Nate Jacobs in Euphoria. And if you don't know who Nate is, he is a football star with a wealthy family, but they have dark secrets within the family. So Nate does bad things to cover things up and he acts out in unhealthy ways to deal with his family issues. What particular scene that reminds me of this story is Nate is picked up after assaulting his girlfriend and the dad protects him and defends him as if it didn't happen. They have a similar name, but yes, one is clearly not reality, but in my mind, my opinion, there is something off about Nathan Brooks. Something smells and I don't know what it is. Do you guys feel that we don't have the whole story? How does a normal teenager unload a gun to his parents' head? Makes no sense. And if you think I'm being hard, the parents have been on several media outlets stating they forgive their son and have received the same feedback I'm giving. If they forgave their son in silence, this video would not exist. So not only did they forgive him, they want everybody to know that they did. I should look at this from every point of view and put myself in the parent's shoes. 
You shoot me and my moneymaker, I'm sorry. Christmas is canceled forever. I still love you from afar. But in all honesty, that is honestly how I feel, that there needs to be consequences for your actions. And there's no escalation if they get in an argument. You know, you slam a door, and then it's, I hate you, mom. And then it's, you know, throwing your clothes around, you know, the normal teenager stuff. But you go from that to shooting him what what if he gets mad at you like what what can he do to you that he has an art he tried to kill you what i don't i don't know i don't know but there's more you guys there is another nathan brooks a real one not my made-up euphoria one there is an actual nathan brooks the other nathan brooks also wanted his parents dead, but guess what? He succeeded. Just in case you guys look up Nathan Brooks, you will also find another um, who actually did kill his parents. It was in September of 1995 in Bel Air, Ohio. He was 16 years old. His mother was Marilyn. It, she had been stabbed and mutilated with both an ax and a knife. His father, Terry, was shot in the head three times with a hunting rifle. His head was cut off and put it, placed in a punch bowl in the kitchen while his body was still in bed where he had been sleeping. Moral of the story is expecting parents don't name your kid Nathan. Just kidding. I'm 99% sure the name has nothing to do with it. I'm going to get off here before I get myself into more trouble. You are welcome for not learning anything today and hopefully not as completely lost with this story as I am. Please leave your thoughts in the comments. Leave whatever emoji best describes the case for you. The movie camera, I guess, because of the CCTV footage that he was caught on. I don't know. Poop emoji. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop, or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my crimey stories playlist if you'd like to check them out. Stay safe my loves and remember if you see something say something and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.